Hello everyone, in this episode we'll discuss the recent Netflix uh, documentary The Social Dilemma that discussed various aspects and what's going wrong with, uh, with, with social networks and th this is a topic on which um, Le and me have like a significant part of our book uh, deals with and which was, um, which was uh, very important in the recent years so as we would like to say always like when we tell people we do research on AI safety they think about uh, killer robots and so on always tell, tell them, no, no, it's or more focused on, on not on the killer robot, but, but on the recommender, recommender system that, that shapes your life and, and your decisions and your opinions. And um, it's, it's good that this, 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 this documentary appeared because now more and more people are finding that uh, arguments like ours, uh, which two years ago, even, in, even at circles, academic circles of AI safety were not, um, were considered as exotic are, are now gaining, gaining momentum. Uh, so, so the do documentary invites a few former employees of large tech companies uh, to, to, to give tes testimonies. Uh, unfortunately, there is no actual employee, which we can understand, because when you, you're hired by these companies, you have to sign non-disclosures, non-disclosure agreements, and, and so on. Uh, and, uh, but, but also, unfortunately, like the set of, the set of people that were invited um, is not a, really a diverse set of opinions of what we can have from, from, from these, uh, even from former employers. And in particular, many people of, uh, have, have left uh, like uh, quite a while and non, almost none of the interviewers, the people who were interviewed have re left recently. So none of them have like a, a recent insight of what's there. Uh, so for, for example, for instance, like at least two of them left in 2010, like in the digital age, a decade, the change of Facebook between 2010 and today is just, is just so huge that, that maybe the insights you have, some of the insights are not relevant anymore. Maybe you need a, a new insights, etc. Uh, so maybe the, uh, Louis uh, would tell would tell us. So what's what's the real problem? What's what's the <laughs> problem here? And wh why why people decided that we needed this documentary? So yeah, so the documentary tries to identify what is the problem. It's, uh, it's very complicated very, because there is a lot of dimension to, to that problem. One of the main points that they identify is the business model on which large-scale social media and social networks are, are built. And uh, this business model uh, relies on uh, advertisement a lot and on maximizing uh, the time users spend on these platforms and, uh, and uh, getting as much user attention as possible. So this led to the famous saying of, uh, if you're not paying, then you are the product. And this documentary explained this saying uh, quite better because before, before watching the documentary, I, I knew about it. I heard it from many places already. But uh, after watching the documentary, I, I better understood. So what, uh, what, you, what the way to think about is that uh, advertisers are paying these social networks and the goal of this uh, investment on uh, advertisement for social network is to change slightly the behavior of all the users of this social network so that their products are sold better. So what these social networks have learned to do is as much as possible, being able to influence uh, the behavior of their users to sell these uh, changes of behaviors to the, to the advertiser company. And so they say, you know, quoting uh, what they say in the documentary is uh, gradually and imperceptibly changing how you behave, what you think, and who you are. That is the product. Um, and this advertising, this uh, advertising model is also uh, put in parallel with uh, the power that this uh, social network uh, have, have built, uh, sp specifically uh, computing power. Uh, they own a uh, thousand of supercomputers that have a sole role to uh, to be able to anticipate and predict our behavior and uh, and compute what will change us the most so that they can uh, get as much benefit on their uh, given their business model as possible. There, there is this nice story in the documentary where you see one user and a virtual clone of that user which uh, is like a puppet and we see three person that uh, symbolize the supercomputers that are computing the recommendations from a social network and deciding what to show on the, on the thread on the, on the, 
on uh, on the page of uh, social network what to scroll for and uh it's really uh, crazy how in how these pictures the the way social networks uh, pick what to show us uh, in order to manipulate us as much as possible yeah from, from a purely uh, cinematographic uh, viewpoint and also like pedagogical viewpoint i think this is the the best idea <laughs> of this uh, documentary because a lot of this is very classic but like the idea of uh, well, I mean, classic in people who think about these technologies, but the idea of replacing this algorithm, this recommendation algorithm, this very abstract recommendation algorithm by three people who uh, do the reasoning out loud of uh, of what the algorithm is doing. I think it really uh, better highlights like all the why why it is that people see, uh, for instance, what they see on on their news feeds, uh, and it really contrasts with the. Uh, well, it really underlines one of the prime of uh, of these, these systems is that people don't realize that a lot of the things that they're exposed to is the result of an algorithm. Uh, and when we talk about AI, artificial intelligence, think, uh, as Mehdi said in the, in the introduction, a lot of people will be thinking about robots and stuff like this. But the, the, the algorithms, the AIs that are the most impactful today, that influence billions of people every day, are the ones that are well, in these uh, on, on our phones that interact with us every day, and the danger of of AI is not this very spectacular thing that we we recognize once we we see them. It's more like this really subtle thing that has invaded our lives, and we don't even realize that we constantly are act, uh, interacting with uh, with. Yes, exactly. They they say in the documentary uh, that AI is already controlling the world, and uh, it's. Quite easy to agree with that, uh, given the scale of uh, of decisions that algorithms are taking every day. So uh, maybe just like to repeat an argument we bring a lot, or we used to bring for the past several years, like for the past four years, and in the book and some of the videos in this channel, like uh, most people don't really realize the scale. Uh, yeah. so like they, they, you can give the YouTube number again. They yeah, so it's like two billion uh, hours of uh, watch time per day for uh, no, one billion hours of watch time for two billion users, so a half an hour for, for, for two billion people on Earth. 70% okay. of which, according to the, for the CPU, the chief product officer or the former chief product officer of YouTube, 70% of these videos were recommended by the algorithm. Yeah. And uh, well, so, so most of the videos are recommended by the algorithm. And it has to be an algorithm that does a lot of the work because like the scales are huge, like billions of recommendations per day. There's 500 hours of new video per minute uh, on YouTube, and they have to be screened for um, well, yeah for copyright and for uh, uh, pedophilia or like very. So we will bring uh, maybe an argument that also we hear less. We hear not, we don't hear a lot, not even maybe in the documentary. Yeah. Uh, so that's something we say in the book is that. Uh, the technical challenge is way, way be, like beyond imagination. So, uh, in like good intention is not enough. So, you, yeah. you have a good intention. I would like to filter, let's say, child uh, pornography and uh, and uh, doing it in an automated manner. When you have an in influx of of five hundred hours of videos per minute, like thirty thousand hours, to thirty thousand hours of video per hour. So if, if you know a bit about statistics and fraud detection, so most of the performance fraud detection algorithms are very costly and they take time, like sometimes they're like quadratic, they don't scale very well with the inputs. So running them on videos does, is not practical. So it, it, there's, there is a technical challenge that is often, that is often um, shaded by the discussion on the intention intentional challenge. So of course there is an intentional challenge. You need to have good intentions or, or otherwise you, you just screw the world. But even if you have good intentions, that's not enough. And uh, it, it, you can't implement good intentions just because you have good intentions. Yeah, yeah. I think this uh, is one of the most uh, important uh, crux of disagreements uh, that we may have with the documentary is that the documentary insists a lot on the incentives problem. And if you think about this, uh, well, we can discuss this uh, at greater length, but it's, it's actually not very really specific to the advertisement uh, business model. Like uh, if you think of uh, Netflix or of China, for instance, they don't have 
this uh, like selling ads uh, incentives, but they're still like the, the same problems. Yeah, yeah like Netflix, like we mentioned that in the book, the CEO of Netflix or the yeah. chief uh, CEO, 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 CEO. I would say that uh, their main competitor is Sleep. And uh, so they're aware that like they're really competing with sleep because like people like, would you go to sleep or you would would you watch another episode? And they're not even ashamed, or at least not sufficiently ashamed of this, to they, prevent they, the CEO from saying out loud like. This not, not, not only that, not only that. So for example, on Twitter, you see a lot of the like a lot of uh, a lot of the community managers of Netflix. I guess they are incentivized to do that. Some teenager would tweet, "Oh, tomorrow I have school at eight. And, uh, and or watch Netflix, and then Netflix would code the tweet with the official Netflix account and, and like make a funny joke about the fact that the teenager is really addicted and the teenager, she or he, would end up watching another episode or, or just like the Netflix like code tweeting and say, like, we are not responsible of your, uh, like you really have to go to, to, to bed. It's yeah. funny, but, uh, it's funny, but um, I found it odd that Netflix didn't, like the the documentary was produced by Netflix, so I would have loved if there was at least a part of like self critique, like uh, like self uh, reflection, on what Netflix also uh, faces as as an addiction problem. Yeah, yeah. Just to say that the incentives prime. I think the the documentary is a bit narrow by saying that the prime is advertisement. I think this is not a, like it's just like these things are extremely influential, and whenever something is extremely influential. Well, there is going to there's going to be a lot of incentives, and so we need you. You had this incentive prime, but it's only part of the prime. Uh, if you want to solve the prime, I think, uh, as Mehdi said, there's a big technical challenge, and we actually need, in addition to to fixing the incentives prime, we need also, uh, I think, a massive investment into uh, better understanding the prime, better providing uh, providing better solutions in in research, essentially, in century, because uh, like. The moderation of all the information that goes through the internet is something that's really critical. And if we don't have like the top people in the world uh, and maybe thousands and maybe even hundreds of thousands of people uh, working on this issue, uh, yeah, like the good intentions will not be enough. So yeah, I would have wished to see the documentary a lot more so uh, conveying this message of saying that, uh, yeah, if you are interested in this problem, if you are, especially if you are a philosopher, a sociologist, or if you are a computer scientist, definitely, or even a mathematician, well, try to, 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 to study the problem and find out what, uh, what contribution you, you could make because we, we need a lot more contributions to solve these problems. Uh, another aspect of the problem that's uh, also mentioned in the documentary is the problem of misinformation. Uh, they give some numbers, for example, the fact that uh, some study revealed that uh, fake news spread uh, six times faster than uh, true news. Uh, that uh, using fake news, uh, you can make more money on social networks simply because of the higher engagement that uh, yeah that is uh, that's come from it. So somehow the the way social networks are built today is uh, gives a bias towards um, increase increased number of fake news, which uh, yeah. Is something that we don't want, and people might think quickly that it doesn't uh, it doesn't matter so much. But uh, unfortunately, these uh, these messages that people are are, are shown uh, influence their behaviors in the, in real life. So there are plenty of examples of people going out and uh, destroying five G towers because of misinformation, and uh, a lot of other things. Like uh, uh, the WHO mentioned that uh, uh, vaccine hesitancies due to uh, misinformation on social network was uh, one uh, critical health uh, issue. Uh, uh, yeah. starting so, so one thing I, I do want to, because uh, that's another, I think it's interesting to talk about the disagreement. Like I think we mostly agree with uh, a lot of the things uh, that the documentary said. But one, one thing again that you can note is that the problem of fake news is not only about like these uh, algorithms trying to maximize uh, for advertisements or, or, for, or for watch time. Uh, there are like through emails or through WhatsApp, like you have the, these systems where uh, there's like much less uh, algorithmic uh, uh, recommendation or, or moderation, and uh, you do have a lot of fake news that, that that circulates arguably a lot faster. Like it's harder to have data about these, of course, but uh, the problem of misinformation is not only the algorithm; it it is partly the algorithm, but it's not only the algorithm, and the problem of trying to uh, either remove or at least 
less we de recommend uh, misinformation and to promote quality information. This is a very, very difficult problem. And uh, we, we, we need to arguably solve it at some point. Like, if you want to address uh, many of the big challenges of the years to come, uh, like the COVID situation, for instance, uh, climate change, uh, the next pandemic, because maybe uh, COVID is arguably cute uh, in a sense, uh, well, it's very, very bad, but it's not that deadly. Like, you could imagine something a lot uh, deadlier. Uh, in the years to come. So we, we need to prepare for all of this. And this requires better, uh, more quality information, uh, people more prepared uh, for, for all of this. Yeah, that's uh, that's one thing uh, Tristan Harris uh, raises in the documentary, that uh, he says, uh, if we can't agree on what's true, then we are toast, uh, citing uh, most of the challenges that you said, Leia, the next pandemic, climate change, and other things. That could come up in the future. Yeah, yeah. So I think I've heard Christian Harris saying that his main motivation for trying to make uh, social media better was climate change, and uh, I think it's a connection that's no, that's not made uh, enough. I think uh, if you want to protect the environment, I, I think the best thing you can do right now is trying to. But one of the best thing, uh, most effective way to to combat uh, climate change is to uh, make sure that there's better quality information circulating on social medias about uh, climate change, because it's a very complicated topic. And um, like there's this one question, is there climate change? Uh, and that's only part of the problem. Like, and you can ask many more questions, like for instance, uh, uh, how important is it to reduce meat consumption? Uh, what is the impact of nuclear energy? And on all of these topics, there's a lot, a lot of, uh, of uh, yeah, quality information that's not promoted uh, enough, arguably. Yeah, so the next problem that they raise in the documentary is the problem of uh, political polarization and uh, manipulation. So I think manipulation is also something that uh, is not uh, relevant in terms of uh, the advertisement model. So it's a, it's a problem that arises from, uh, from other So simply that these social network have huge influence because they show content to uh, billions of users every day. So simply for this reason, they will be, uh, some actors will try to manipulate them because they want to have control on what uh, information is spread there. And uh, uh, this, this manipulation often uh, is uh, uh, as an orientation, as a political orientation. Uh, yeah. Uh, like one, one example, uh, just to imagine how bad uh, 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 mass manipulation uh, and political polarization is. There's this example of of, uh, of, Myanmar, of Myanmar, for instance. Uh, so in the north of Myanmar, there's this uh, uh, ethnic uh, community called the Rohingyas, and they have been uh, well uh, uh, persecuted based on misinformation and well, uh, it's a sort of racism. And uh, this has led to a, a genocide, like a, a lot of, uh, I think it was like uh, tens of thousands of people died, something like this, and hundreds of, like 700,000 people, uh, refugees. About a million refugees. I think the, the, the figure is. But this is like huge. Uh, and this like originated from a lot of misinformation uh, circulating on Facebook. Uh, uh, over 900,000 refugees have fled, yeah. have fled their, their homes. Well, a, a million, a million refugees. and. Some like depending on the numbers you can find, uh, like the U the United Nations uh, High Committee on 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 refugees, like lists uh, like recognizes at least uh, like order uh, uh, the order of one million. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's, it's very important here maybe to say that that Facebook uh, uh, acknowledged that uh, it failed to act, and uh, most importantly, so after pressure from the UN, not not only it said it failed to act, it recognized that it's also actively dismissed uh, calls for action from uh, human rights uh, groups. So mm. here, like, we clearly have like an incentive problem, not only a technical problem. Yeah. But, but what, what's interesting is like, the problem is, has been recognized, acknowledged at least by Facebook, which is uh, quite a big step forward. Like, uh, uh, so hopefully, if, like, more of these messages uh, go out there. Uh, then it's going to be easier also to put pressure on, on Facebook. Like uh, if even Facebook acknowledges that this is a problem, it's it's easier to incentivize 
Facebook and people within Facebook to take care of this problem uh, seriously, even though like uh, it, it's hard. Like, and lately there's been uh, some, uh, some uh, Sophie Zhang, uh, former employee of, of Facebook, who uh, who was well, through memos that should not have been leaked. But like essentially, like the bottom line is. Uh, she, she she strongly believes, and from and she was in the inside, that this is a completely dismissed, like too way too dismissed at least uh, within Facebook uh, so far. And she said this especially for uh, like smaller countries, for which uh, uh, if there's some disaster, it's less likely to make uh, uh, the the front pages of, of newspapers. And uh, this is again a, a bit of an incentive uh, structure problem because like within Facebook, there's uh, this uh, public relation team and they're trying to uh, avoid uh, like uh, public uh, relation disasters. And if it's like a small country, they are much less incentivized than it is if it is uh, like a, uh, a rich country. Like, it's not even a matter of size of the country, it's more like, whether it's, like how likely it is to be uh, talked about uh, in the New York Times, for instance. Well, all of these problems are probably going to be uh, <laughs> exacerbated uh, in the coming uh, weeks. <laughs> We're talking about weeks now <laughs> uh, in, for the US. Uh, oh, yeah, while we are recording this, we're like 40 days away from the US election. Yeah. So the day before we were recording this, so I, ho I hope it will be fast on, on editing the video and uploading it. So the day we were recording this, like the, the yesterday, uh, Vladimir Putin, so the, this was reported in Reuters. Vladimir Putin invited the U.S. to sign an, an, a deal, like a peace treaty, some form of peace treaty, on digital misinformation. So he said, like, I invite like the U.S. to sign a treaty where each of us commits to stop doing digital misinformation and in electoral interference. So, so, so you could see this as a at least an origin that they do they do it <laughs> an origin that they know they can do it so. yeah and uh and, and invite an invitation to just like sign a deal and he compared this deal to the 1972 deal between the ussr or the, like the soviet union and uh, and the united states of america so so they, they're like there is a raise in awareness of the scale of the problem not only of the scale of the problem that the problem could become out of control so because if I'm a big state and I can use this tool, why I would sign a deal with another big state to stop using the tool? So arguably, because like from a just game theoretic point of view, I know that like this deal, I'm, I'm like, it's better for me to sign this deal with the US if I'm Russia and vice versa. Uh, because, um, because if I don't sign it, like if I would not only face the states of the United States or vice versa of Russia, but I would face an intractable uh, uh, phenomenon like uh, wherever there is a group of five people with enough money they could start attacking me like la last year facebook twitter reported a, a, a misinformation campaign originating from saudi arabia and the united arab emirates and um, also egypt targeting an arab audience that was successful in reaching 14 million people quite effectively like in the sense that uh, in this 14 million people i think they only counted people who like follow the Facebook page, uh, like actively like the content or not. Like not just not just um, the, the the the. I don't think they were counting. So for example, if I like the page and Lay sees the contents because I like the page, I don't think Lay was counted. So so it's like real interaction, I think, uh, which is a big scale. And uh, even even if it was indirect uh, interaction, because the cost of the campaign was only a hundred thousand dollars. So hundred thousand dollars is like the cost of an, this is this is an example we have in our book. Uh, it's it's less than the cost of an electoral campaign in a small city in Morocco, or Algeria, like in a, in a poor country. So we, with this budget, you can reach fourteen million people. So I guess if you multiply it by ten, you can reach uh, larger scales. And this budget is within the reach of like a, it's it's within the reach of a, of a, of a, a median uh, a median. Uh, uh, a median uh, network network of, of of let's say what a French citizen. So imagine if like uh, w w whenever you find the five motivated people to put a hundred thousand dollars together to attack a state, they can do it. 
so it, it will scale and it will become out of control. So there is an incentive for big states to sign this kind of agreements. And I think it's a good thing for the world to so that they sign these kind of agreements. And then, but then like to enforce it, it's also yeah. very challenging because you have to control how it's happening. But now this good. But just recognizing that uh, this kind of cyber war warfare is one of the main concerns that we should have uh, for a lot of institutions. I think this can change a lot of uh, the way we think about these problems. And especially, I think, in the end, what I care most is much more investment exactly. into solutions. Uh, and then maybe like just like to mention this, like the point in the book, we talk about the democratization of cyber warfare. So just we just gave an example, like it's within the reach of small groups of individuals to start attacking states, or at least like start attacking significant portion of a state's uh, uh, opinion. Um, so like it, it is really important we start looking at solutions and also uh, anticipating anticipating how this will evolve. Maybe I can say something about that. But so. Yeah, uh, one other uh, disagreement I would say we, we may have with uh, some, some, at least some interviewees in the documentary is that I think there's a, a lot of the, the, like the documentary almost presented it as a consensus that uh, we should regulate uh, these platforms and that uh, regulation is the only way to go. And I think this is a dangerous message to, to believe that it is the only way to go. Um, like for sure, like we, we need to, to, to reason about like how do we better control the system. So like regulation is, is a desirable thing, but like if you want an efficient and uh, uh, regulation is probably going to have to go through uh, at least the government, but probably through uh, this, uh, the Congress and, and stuff like this. And it's going to involve a lot of people. Uh, and uh, whenever you have a decision that's made by a lot of people, it's going to, especially if it's get politicized, and like these days, like a lot of topics are very politicized in, in the US, especially well, throughout the world, but in particular in the US. And yeah, there are many ways it can go wrong, uh, I'd say. Uh, and if even if it doesn't, it's going to take years. Like uh, these things uh, do not happen uh, like that. Uh, and uh, we have an example of, of such a law uh, in uh, the European Union or the, the GDPR, the uh, General uh, uh, Data Protection uh, Regulation. Uh, this was written up in 2012, and it took six years for it to be uh, enforced in uh, in the European Union. Uh, six years is quite fast, uh, in, like in the law in general. Uh, and it has to take a long time for everyone to agree, but also to make sure that the law is, really works, like is meaningful and applies in practice. Uh, but six years in terms of um, artificial intelligence, uh, algorithms, social networks, uh, in this world, six years is like, uh, is the lifetime of a company, like uh, of many companies. Uh, so it, it, it may be way too long. and the way these uh, social medias and the algorithms are going to work in six years may be actually very different from the way it is now. So just imagine back like in 2014, even uh, like six years ago, trying to predict the algorithms that we have today, it, it was extremely hard. And to make laws that were, uh, uh, that, that fit the way algorithms are today is extremely hard. So I think there are caveats that need to be taken into account when you, you're thinking about regulation. And uh, well, all in all, it suggests that it's not going to be sufficient. And there's even a risk that uh, it fails or that it becomes counterproductive uh, because some, uh, some politician like, pushed in, in for something that was uh, actually not uh, very useful. I think it's dangerous to think that we should put all our, all our energy into regulation uh, because uh, like one consequence, uh, 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 I have in mind about this is that uh, top scientists, top engineers, top top managers in these companies will say, "Well, we're just going to wait for the regulation to come." And I think this is like uh, like if you have to wait five years, I think it, like there are huge risks uh, within this uh, uh, time frame. And instead, I think we should be proactive as of today. Uh, anyone who can, and we could, we should encourage like managers. Uh, uh, well, it's hard, but uh, employees, uh, d software developers, and also researchers within these companies and outside of these companies to just like tackle the problem themselves 
so taking the whole prime is very hard, but trying to, to promote ideas that go this way, to uh, work on some potential partial solutions, to better understand uh, the changes, to uh, like ask for journalists to, to better to uh, inquire what's going on in these companies, uh, what are the impacts on the users. That there's a lot of, of stuff to be done that are not regulations, and I wish these were. One more problem that is mentioned in, uh, in the documentary is the problem of uh, mental health and how uh, especially uh, young users are affected by these platforms. So some statistics that don't directly uh, show that uh, these platforms are causing uh, suicide, but we can see an, an increase in young girls of suicide that is uh, threefold between uh, 2010 and now. And uh, this is uh, quite scary because one thing we can, uh, one thing we see obviously changed between the, the life of uh, a younger, young girls in 2010 and now is the, the increase, uh, exponential increase of uh, social medias. Uh, other uh, statistic that are not, uh, not very happy to look at is that uh, young people get a less driving license and uh, also have a less romantic relationship than, uh, than they used to. And, uh, and we, can build an, uh, we, we can understand this as a, as a side effect of uh, spending uh, so much time and attention on the social network that are extremely addictive. And in the documentary, they show this example of a, of a young girl that spent her time taking photo of herself, posting it on social media so that she can uh, receive uh, uh, likes from uh, friends, from people that follow her and that tell her she's beautiful. And, the few times that uh, she receives uh, negative comments, we see that it's uh, extremely strongly affect her emotions, and uh, we can understand this is the case of uh, a lot of, uh, of young people using social medias. Uh, there is uh, there is the same trend happening with uh, TikTok that uh, is said to make you become uh, extremely famous from uh, within a, a split second uh, without uh, even realizing it that you go from. 10 people following you to 100,000 people liking or commenting on, uh, on your posts and photos. Well, there is a lot of research about, about this, but maybe there needs to be even more research about this uh, because clearly uh, social medias have changed the way we, we interact with a lot of different people. And uh, yeah, there are a lot of very uh, concerning data, uh, especially about like, uh, for instance, depression, uh, suicide, uh, there's also, I think, a concern to be had about, uh, like, for instance, uh, the increase of loneliness can have also all sorts of other impacts as well. Uh, maybe an increase of aggressivity. Uh, so there's a, a great video by Kurtzkazak about this. A and then this can create all other sorts of problems. So uh, I think like mental health is extremely important in itself, uh, but it also has impact on other aspects. Uh, Better, like more curiosity, maybe curiosity is extremely negatively impacted by, by all of this. And this uh, hinders our ability to, to, to discuss uh, complicated topics such as uh, climate change. Uh, yeah, so again, I think this is a, a very concerning uh, uh, aspect of the social media. Um, I just wanted to, to mention something here, like on, on, on mental, not med, like mental health, but like psychological part of, of, of social media. But, just linking this part on, on psychological aspects and the previous part on polarization. So I've been, I've been running an amateurish uh, research for uh, more than a month now on uh, on a group like on a network of, of fake profiles, like uh, clearly like fake profiles, which looks like state uh, state run uh, or at least state uh, uh, paid for. <laughs> uh, cl clearly run like clearly um, motivated. Uh, by a state in China. like it has the scale of something that is at least even state either state run or paid for by a state uh, something like an emerging phenomenon that um, like this is still like observations and i would really like researchers who have the data if they ever watch this video to to, to like test it which is now like beyond the classic trend of fake profiles to harass people and tweet at people or like promote an opinion that's the, like a classic way to do uh, to do bots and trolling. I'm remarking a new trend where you create an army of trolls, not just to harass people or tweet to them, but to give them likes for things you want them to say more and not for things you don't want to say. So 
like instead of creating fake profiles that like, like let's say Louis and Lay would be on Twitter and they are known, I am a fake profile. So if I'm starting to promote my ideology, nobody would believe me because now people are more and more aware that they are trolls. So people would look at your date of creation or oh, September 20, 2020, probably a fake profile I would dismiss. So instead of me tweeting as a fake profile, I would look at Louis and Lay, and if Lee, if 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 Louis starts saying something that uh, that I want to be promoted, I would give like, I would bring my army of trolls and send to Louis thirty likes, or like twenty retweets, and then when Louis is not talking about my ideology, I would not give Louis any like or retweet, and. Uh, what I'm observing, like over a month, that like there's evidence that some people start to be nudged by these army of trolls. So, which is more efficient because if Twitter detects my army of trolls, I lose the army of trolls, but I don't lose Louis, who is a real human. I would just bring another army for the next month and then start nudging Louis again. So Louis becomes my tool. And I, I really, I really like. I, 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 it's not my field. This is clearly not my field. I'm a theoretician. I do mathematics. But I would really uh, like to see more research into this new trend of using trolls to influence people by sending them, sending them likes and retweets. Yeah, yeah, and you can imagine like uh, if there are like uh, hundreds or thousands of, uh, of of fake accounts that do this, you have people who will receive like hundreds or, or thousands of likes, uh, which is like for, for most users, uh, for, for me at least, it's a huge amount of likes, and you you. Even if you try not to care about this, but most people care about this by default, I guess. But even if you try not to care about this, it's very hard to be neutral about this. Like you, you always receive this dopamine, as uh, as discussed in this documentary, and it's like in research. Uh, and this changes. Uh, this is like uh, reinforcement uh, learning, and this is, and this really changes uh, people's be behavior. And this. Oh. It's because like you see, like not only like a hundred of likes is a lot for an average like yeah. it's like just a, a ten like they don't do it in an obvious manner so like they do ten five fifteen twenty and like when you look at the likes you find the same army troll like I've been following a group for more than a month as I said and now it's like recurrent I see a suspicious tweet that is from an unknown person a real person I know that got suddenly like uh, 20 or sweets and 20 likes and then i go to the list and i see like i recognize all the lists of trolls that are already uh, like uh, uh, that i've already in my list of of of, of trolls and uh, like with with 20 likes 20 retweets you can not not only nudge people you can also make people famous like you can if you start like an account starts having a hundred likes or retweets people start thinking it is relevant like because of exposition bias like yeah. Expose it to this account that is that has like lots of likes and retweets, and then the, the account of Louis, like this hypothetic real person I'm trying to influence, starts getting more real people following Louis. So not only I can nudge Louis, but I can make Louis famous and then use Louis even more. Yeah. Well, this I, really, not... I really would like like this is something clearly not researched. Like there's a lot of research on the classic use of fake accounts, and. Um, Try to get in touch, like this, like uh, my email in my website or something. Like we can discuss. I have like if, like preliminary. I have like a data set that you can maybe use to start and then grow, and uh, maybe maybe you can just show that my uh, my hypothesis is wrong. So that um, I have yeah. I have like one month of one month of daily uh, like uh, about ten hours per day spent on this and uh, enough evidence to to believe it. Yeah, so it's still preliminary research, but it sounds like something uh, so effective that I would be surprised if, uh, uh, like, no like disinformation uh, campaign has used it yet. Cool. So finally, in the in the documentary, they discuss also what are solutions to that problem. So they mentioned previously uh, regulations and why they are very slow processes that uh, that are likely not to be uh, useful enough in, in, in due time. Uh, also, the, the goal of such regulations would be to change the incentives of these uh, platforms, but we also discussed that uh, the incentives and the ad money from advertisement is not the only problem, and there are other problems caused by this, like uh, manipulation by uh, other actors, for example. Yep. Uh, they, they discuss about the possibility of uh, deleting your social medias and uh, accounts. 
and that is uh, something that sounds okay but uh, might also not be desirable simply for all the positive aspect and all the good things that the social media bring. Um, we can think in terms of uh, if we want to um, make social media better, imagine, and uh, use them to fight uh, the challenges of humanity like uh, climate change or the next pandemic, then they are extremely amazing tool to, uh, to propagate the right kind of useful information that uh, people need to hear and understand in order to, to change their behavior to to act uh, properly in, a, in a, for, for the challenges we are concerned about. And uh, other things that are amazing, this, this in the documentary, it's for example, uh, being able to access Uber and with just one click, uh, having a taxi coming in front of your home and going where you want to go within less than one minute is, a, is an extremely nice technology to, to have access to. Yeah, I think the, there's a lot of benefits of uh, quality people who care about these things and uh, uh, to, to, to do a lot of good through social medias because you can have, uh, you can influence a lot of people and, and promote better quality information. So I think it's important for many people to, 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 to stay on, on social media. But there's definitely a risk of, of mental health issues and all the things we've discussed. And so I think it, it, it's better like to promote a, health, a more he a healthier uh, use of, uh, of social medias. And uh, one thing uh, well, I'm sure, like at least Tristan Heiss uh, mentioned him, mentioned it at some point, but it was cut from the documentary. But one thing I would have been would have been nice nice to see is like there are many tricks you can you can implement to have a, a healthier use of the social medias. One of them is like uh, adding apps that, for instance, block social medias uh, for a given period of time. So I personally use this, for instance. I think it's very uh, useful and effective. Uh, removing notifications, I think uh, many notifications are, are like extremely harmful, like to have all of the time. So, yeah, and just like caring more, like having a, 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 a yeah, having a better relation essentially with your phone, uh, trying to avoid the addiction while using, exposing for the all of the, the good parts you can do uh, using all of this, uh, I think would have been a nicer message to to, to send. Yeah, another thing that uh, that I would really like to see uh, more in the world is uh, discussions around the ethics of a uh, recommender system and uh, uh, agreeing that uh, what recommender system pick to show to uh, to billions of users is uh, an ethical question. Even though every decision, small decision taken separately, does not have a large impact, but because it concerns billions of decisions and billions of hours of human attention every day. Uh, together, this makes it for an extremely, extremely important ethical challenge. Uh, okay, like beyond what you just said, which was covered in the, the documentary, and also we find uh, like the, 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 like the, there's something maybe original we should and can promote, and we are actively promoting, which is like when we say like using social networks for good. Yeah, people like you mentioned good like examples, classic examples, but if we think in the context of pandemic, uh, social networks were not used as much as they could be as a cure and I, I mean like as a cure as a as a as a medical as a medical uh, device as a as a medical not device like um uh, treatment uh, yeah intervention intervention mm -hmm. so as, as a medical intervention and uh, so people like people when we hear like it talks about like ai and health ai and health uh, or very overhyped because like what people think of when they say ai and health are like devices, mini robots, like plugged to your blood, and, and then maybe analyzing your metabolism to your sweat and uh, connected to whatever. And this is arguably uh, not yet uh, delivered, like it's under delivering compared to the promises and the number of talks and, 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 and hype over it and conferences. But we don't mention uh, social networks enough in when we say AI and health, just like growth under system. Just like showing you, uh, in the 20th century, the World Health Organization was uh, was was very efficient in that. Like, the, uh, I grew up in Morocco. I grew up in Morocco, and in, the, in my childhood in the 90s, a significant part of the TV advertisements were was was health advertisement, like public public health advertisement, like about washing hands or about uh, uh, vaccination of kids or about uh, like. Uh, 
uh, yeah, like uh, hygiene and, 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 and things like that, or like the danger of uh, antibiotics. In France, you have this campaign about like eating fruits and, and vegetables uh, five days per day, like five times per day after every advertisement of, of, of a snack or of, of, of a food product. Uh, we can think of a world where uh, social networks would be encouraged or not obliged uh, for like obliged to have a, a fraction, let's say, 5% of the ads they say they, they show uh, free ads for 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 health uh, ministries and for example like uh, an example in the, the early covid is that uh, uh, spot like uh, videos that were produced by health ministries over the world were not as popular on youtube as the regular youtube activity like the regular uh, uh, entertainment and and youtube starts acting like they they acted rather quickly you have this whole covid banner and like a disclaimer etc uh, but the things could be done better like uh, you could promote um, more proactively but then all, again the caveat is that the challenge like it's a challenge to ask because if you start promoting let's say every state uh, run video like if you detect that this is a youtube channel of a state and start promoting all the content and then some states are promoting fake cures so, so, so the task for YouTube is not easy either. So I, I don't know what's happening inside. So I don't have a lot of, I don't have, I have zero insights about how they did it, but I can imagine that they might have thought about it and then said, but then what if a state is run by a dictator that starts, that starts promoting unhealthy behavior or unhealthy cures? So, so putting an algorithmic promotion, like it's saying to the algorithm, if you detect that this video is from the States, then probably it's safer to promote it. You end up maybe promoting bad content. So it's, yeah. not, it's not easy. Yeah, again, it's a very difficult problem and we need a lot more brilliant people uh, working on this problem, trying to figure out what would be good uh, recommendation algorithms that are robust and yeah, robustly beneficial. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but there's a, a line of research that uh, gets more and more like there are, there's a growing research, um, both within these companies, but uh, but also in academia, who care more and more about uh, all of these issues. So there has been a, a paper recently called uh, uh, "Ethical Changes of Recommended Systems," for instance, that really highlights uh, the, this problem. Um, and uh, yeah, I think this should be given a lot more importance than it is uh, currently given, both from journalists and these companies, but also from scientists themselves. I think it's all still often frowned upon within science uh, to be talking about uh, these issues. And uh, I think it's time to, that more people tackle the, them. <laughs> Don't want to make the episode longer than it is. So. Yeah, I think it's already quite long. <laughs> there are many things to add. I think we will have uh, several other episodes. We will talk about uh, this line of research because, like, we were personally involved in it somehow. Uh, we wrote a book on it uh, two years ago. This was out in 2019. Uh, we are writing a paper on on it now, uh, like on how to use social networks as a, as a medical intervention. And uh, so we'll have another episode to talk about this. Like uh, the paper that Leah mentioned, uh, we'll just put a link below. And uh, yeah, we, we will make several, several other episodes of the upcoming episodes. We, we touch on the topic of social networks and how, how, how we could make them work for good, actually, not just pointing what goes wrong. Yeah. Like there are like easy, like the easy solutions of like delete your accounts, delete this, delete that. Uh, I've like published a thread. In, like when, when the Cambridge Analytica scandal was out in 2018, there was a campaign to delete Facebook accounts in 2018, and I, actually, I don't like to like this is my personal opinion. I I'm not I'm not I'm not comfortable with how, what Facebook does today, but I still believe it's not the best thing to do. Because if, if the, to 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 leave like to delete the accounts mm -hmm. like or to leave it, because we need like there's like a significant billion scale fraction of people using Facebook, and if like a tiny fraction of us leaves Facebook and. It was just like decrease the amount of pressure done by people who have enough information and educational backgrounds to put efficient pressure on Facebook. So yeah. I'd rather like pressure Facebook than leave Facebook, but unless Facebook disappears. 
which is another question. But like the, the thing is like it's there and people are using it. And like many groups, like especially like in developing countries, for some people, it's like their main way to organize and socialize and communicate on the like for them it's like some people equate it to the internet, which is which is strange, but and it's like that. So and uh, they will still be influenced by Facebook. So um, uh, so so like it, it's an easy fix. Personally, it's maybe like the best thing to do for your personal health to leave Facebook. But then, if you want to have a positive impact on the people remaining on Facebook, maybe it's not it's not the best thing to do. But but but, but again, if there is a threshold of people leaving Facebook, clearly that's a good signal, and Facebook will, will push to react. But so so just so talking about like the easy solution, like delete this, delete that, or not like uh, like you, we can clearly go beyond the delete and not delete, and not only that, and that's something the the documentary was not um, was not good at, which is talking about like all all the good things that happened since two thousand eighteen, all yeah. the efforts and like the massive efforts, the teams that have been growing uh, in all of these companies, almost all of these companies, like for example, the Twitter team, like uh, just like. The Twitter team, the Twitter safety team is, they are overwhelmed with work. Like for example, I personally um, struggle to get them react to when I like uh, find like a state run operation or like a network of fake profile. But then I just recently learned that a major group of misinformation in Europe, which, which was established, like it's like they are like a major group of people more famous than me, more professional than me, that this is their job. And even them, they struggle have this Twitter team uh, React quickly because not not because not just like maybe because they don't care about some countries and that's another problem another problem but also because they're overwhelmed with what's happening in the U.S. Like someone yeah. told me, I've been trying to reach them since April and like like they're overwhelmed like of what's happening in the U.S. So maybe like my opinion is that all of these teams in all of these companies are still under dimensioned like they still can be larger than what they think they are that they should be. Like you can still multiply the, the number of people working in these teams by five or ten or even twenty, and you will still need more people given the the, the, the amount of the, the scale of the, the challenge. The CEO of Twitter recognized that this week, like this like this week when we were registering and like recording this episode, he said that like this, so like the biggest challenge facing Twitter is misinformation. But again, like as much as much as like they are not responsive and they are overwhelmed, they're also very transparent. And one good thing to say about the Twitter safety team compared to, for example, the Facebook safety team is that they are rather more transparent. And since they are more transparent, researchers have more input from them. And, and also, since they react, like when they react, like even if like there's a misinformation campaign that is small scaled in Twitter, but large scaled on Facebook, you can, you can go through the public discussion on Twitter and get insights about this misinformation. But it goes under the radar on Facebook. So one way, like I discussed with people working on this, and like one way we agreed on is that you find the misinformation campaign in Twitter, you show that it is there, and if Twitter reacts, then Facebook has like a social pressure to follow. So even though researchers could not spot the campaign on Facebook, because you spot the Twitter part of the campaign, and you are sure there is a Facebook part of it, if Twitter reacts, and because they have a track record of, of reacting and being transparent, Facebook has a social pressure to react, and others also would react, like YouTube, etc. So, 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 just like this was just like a shootout to the Twitter safety team. Like, even though they are not responsive, they are they, when they act, it pushes others to act, and vice versa. Yeah, and you mentioned a lot uh, the importance of social pressure. I think this has been a bit neglected in the documentary. It was a bit mentioned, but I think it's still neglected. Like we, we, we can change then, the incentives by putting pressure. But then now, like something we mentioned and not mentioned in the documentary is that these tools are there. And uh, I think we talked a lot about their negative side effect, like negative side. And we, we tend to underestimate like the, the, the side effect of boycott. Like we, we need to, like the, the tools are there and we should use them. Like we should use them just like the ministries of health use the television. To promote vaccines and health and, and hygiene in the 90s, in the 80s, and the 70s, we should we should like grab the tools and use them for good, and not just abandon them and boycott them. Yeah, yeah. And interestingly, like the these companies, uh, especially YouTube, uh, have uh, given more importance, uh, for instance, to to the World Health Organization during the pandemic, 
I think it's nice to acknowledge this. Hi, in 2008, yeah, YouTube listed the uh, vaccine hesitancy as something they would be uh, posit like uh, actively acting on. Yeah. And other companies also released similar statements. Yeah, so there are good things coming from these companies. Maybe not good enough. Hmm. Uh, well, I don't think good enough, but it's uh, partly a problem of incentives, but it's also a problem of... Uh, well, uh, my argument also is a problem of human resources. Like my, my opinion I mean, like, is that most of these teams, like the teams working in misinformation could be larger than what they are now. Yep. Like, there's enough need and uh, the resources to, to have more people working on it. Yep. So I hope they they will grow them. They will grow these uh, safety teams because I think it's more needed than ever. Yeah. With this, we wrap up and uh, we thank you for your attention. If you stayed all, all the way to, until here and then see you. Bye. See you. Bye.